And now that we've experienced the terrifyingly tense film alone, let's meet the man behind it. Hi, John Hyams. Welcome to the Grimfest stage. Hey, uh, this is John. I'm uh, thrilled to be at Grimfest. Uh, so far, it's been it's been fantastic. Just uh, talking to people about this film so far, and uh, and and I'm excited to be a part of this festival. I'm excited for the people in the UK to be seeing alone. I think we can all agree that the idea of being followed by a stranger on the open road is quite terrifying. But what exactly makes it so scary? Well. I think that uh, alone, just like any good suspense thriller, taps into primal fears. You know that that's kind of what you're after, and that's what I'm interested in. In and and meeting a stranger on the open road. I mean, even beyond that, just being alone on the open road where you are far from, uh, where you're isolated and far from civilization. I think that taps into the most basic primal fear of not having anyone a aware of where you are but b i think that in our essence as human beings we seek comfort in company that's why people congregate in cities uh, that's why people are not evenly dispersed across the map so there is a desire as animals in the wild to congregate and uh, when we are physically separated from many others now suddenly we start to look at uh, other individuals and everything else around us as a potential hazard so I think alone existentially taps into this idea again of being alone also just the very idea that when you are in isolation uh, how do you how do you view a stranger is a strange you know as children we're taught not to talk to strangers um but we're also taught to be friendly to people and one of the things i loved about matthias olsen's script for alone was that in the first act of the story it really kind of examines that duality of our nature, which is A, we are conditioned to want to be friendly, to not be rude, but by the same token, we're also supposed to view outsiders as a potential threat. There is indeed a happy ending for Jessica, but is there something we can learn about how the character handles this situation? I think most uh, stories that you're telling have some kind of lesson or moral um, and I think in alone, the lesson or moral that comes out of it is less, it's less of a cautionary tale. Don't trust strangers. You know, our protagonist already doesn't trust a stranger. I think the morals and the, and, and the lessons that come out of our story are, have much more to do with, um, the in, in, internal struggle that our character is dealing with, because I think this story and this character uh, in her essence, is a person struggling with grief. And in many ways, her the external thriller that's playing out with this tormentor is, is uh, you know, a, a very unveiled metaphor for, for what's happening internally. And, and I think what we learn from this story is that uh, is literally you can try to run from your, you know, run from your problems, you can run from your grief, but ultimately it's only when you confront these things that you're actually able to wrestle with them and, and gain some independence over them and find strength within yourself. Both the protagonist and antagonist deal with the subject of duality, but whilst the protagonist does quite well with it, the antagonist ultimately finds his demise. Where exactly is the difference between the two characters' journey? For uh, a story like this where you have, essentially it's a two-hander, you have your protagonist and your antagonist. Um, I think for the story to work, your your hero and villain need to be uh, kind of uh, 
they need to be equally well-rounded, you know, and equally, uh, they need to be given um, their own story. They need to be three-dimensional. I think if the, if, if the story is only as good as the villain is, and the villain can't be sort of a, a, a just, um, he can't just be a someone that doesn't have multiple sides, just like the protagonist. Otherwise the thing falls apart. And in many ways, what, we used to talk about a lot and talk about with Mark uh, Menchaca, who, who plays the man, is that uh, this is also the worst day of his life. You know, this is not, um, he, he's having, this is, did not go according to plan for him. And I think Mark's way of, of portraying a character like this, he thought of it as this is a guy who's, who's trying to feed his addiction and suddenly he's facing uh, the threat of exposure. And what is he, what's he willing to do to, uh, to, to avoid exposure? Now, um, on the other hand, we have the character of Jessica, who is, again, someone like, uh, who's living a, a dual life. She obviously is running away from something or escaping something in her case, uh, a a traumatic incident. And she's decided that she's going to pack up and leave. But in many ways, what we're, what we're showing you is that, you know, your trauma, your past, it will, it will find its way back to you and confront you eventually. I think the difference between these two characters, if you're just going to, uh, look at them purely as their journeys of these characters. The villain, the man, is fighting to suppress the exposure of who he really is. Whereas Jessica is 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 forced to confront and and ultimately uh, and ultimately reconcile with who she is. So in it, her journey is is a hero's journey and and because she is moving through her, you know, the, the challenge that she's dealing with. And uh, he's, you know, in the best possible light, he's still moving to suppress uh, exposure of his problem. However, they're both very human instincts and we're both guilty of, of both of those things. Throughout the film, I honestly could not help but wonder, is the look of the villain actually inspired by uh, perhaps a real life serial killer? So the look of uh, Mark Menchaca's character, the man, um, was something that we really carefully considered, as is everything with this character, his, the car that he drives. Um, we did not want it to read as obviously malevolent. You know, we didn't want him to wear his psychosis on his sleeve so that you're, every time you look at him, it's keeping you guessing a little bit is this guy super threatening or is this guy, you know, a very kind of benign figure? Um, so, uh, you know, Ashley Russell, who was our costume designer, you know, she found kind of the right jacket for him to wear. You know, we wanted him to, we, we didn't want him to be some kind of backwoodsy, uh, you know, stereotypical redneck type. We didn't want him to be overly urbane either. So, it's like something about that jacket with the plaid inside. It was green. It was almost the kind of thing that uh, a more suburban or urban individual, we gave him facial hair. We didn't want to give him a full beard. So we thought we'll give him a mustache, but the mustache will just be like slightly too long on the edges. You know, it, it, there's something seems innocuous about it. And then something seems a little bit off. Uh, and then at one point, I remember uh, it wasn't in the original plan. I think our I think our producer producer Jonathan Rosenthal had like had a pair of these clear frame glasses, or maybe he just had gotten a hold of them and was wearing them, uh, joking around. And and I thought those would those would look great for um, for the man and for Mark. You know, he tried them on, and Mark really liked them. And uh, after he was, you know, we were just kind of, we hadn't been shooting yet, but we were thinking about him. And then uh, I realized, I think after we even chose them, that they were Jeffrey Dahmer's glasses. And, uh, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer 
who is is almost uh, the most prototypical serial killer in the minds of most people. But but Jeffrey Dahmer was not a terrifying looking individual. Jeffrey Dahmer looked like a Midwestern guy next door. And something about those glasses almost, uh, they almost soften his, his look a little bit. And, uh, and, and I thought, you know, and, and there's a very kind of significant moment in, in Alone where he finally does take the glasses off, um, almost as if to say, okay, he's no longer hiding behind this uh, urban facade. Um, he's, he's going to be his true self in this moment. Um, so yes, in some ways we are tipping the hat to, uh, certain serial killers. It's something about these, the, you know, the guy asking for help and presenting himself in a vulnerable way. And I think that was, those are the considerations of his look. Sticking with the antagonists, I did notice that interestingly, uh, he didn't actually use firearms until at least the halfway point. Why did you choose to do that? The decision for, of uh, what weapons uh, the man uses in, uh, throughout the course of, of a loan is, is very intentional. Um, I think in the, in the early going, he's, he's not armed with a firearm. Uh, he's, he's using different things. And I think the reason is that we're trying to imply that what he's, what he's doing with Jessica in the first half of the story where he's trying to set a trap for her and capture her. Uh, there's obviously a very studied, meticulous way he's going about it. And in the case of that, it is a, it, there's a thrill of the hunt element to this. He's not interested in just, uh, just shooting someone and finishing them off. And that's that he obviously has a process by which he goes through uh, to, to achieve what he wants to achieve. And it's for some, it's to feed some, some deep impulse uh, addiction as, as, as Mark would say. So that doesn't involve just um, murder. And in many ways, we also don't really specify what, he intends to do with her. I felt like leaving that out uh, was more was more important. It was it, it is ultimately again to play upon your imagination. You don't really know what his intentions are for her, and so you can now think of all the different scenarios instead of having him narrow it down and be specific about what he intends to do with her and how long he intends to keep her there. There, there is a wide range of possibilities. Then at a certain point in the story, um, she escapes. So now at that point for him, she's just become a problem. She's become vermin in your yard that you got to take care. She's the rat that's eating your vegetables. So now he's uh, using, you know, then when he goes out to hunt her at that point in time, um, He's going to use a firearm. He's going to use a hunting rifle. Um, and, and it is the one that he inherits from, from Robert the hunter. Uh, again, that whole scene with Robert was, was still part of his manipulation. You know, it was still, he still was using his powers of seduction and manipulation to almost kind of get this man to hand her over. Um, but then when it reaches a certain point where now she's just become a real problem with him, she's out there in the world as a, as, as a, a loose end that needs to be tied up. Now he's going to, he's going to go on a hunt and no longer is he, I don't think in the second half, he's necessarily enjoying this. This wasn't part of the plan. Now he's actually, she's become a stressful situation that he really needs to take care of. Now, I did notice that there was somewhat of an auditory motif running through the film, namely the sound of the trees swaying in the wind. How important was sound design for the film and why this sound in particular? I think the, uh, the audio uh, in Alone is equally, if not more important than, than the visual. I, I believe that about all... Uh, 
all movies for the most part. Um, and, and I think this, this movie is, is, is really an auditory, uh, experience and we, and through sound, we can, we can experience a different level of subjectivity, uh, than we even can through, through images. Um, I think the work by, by Samuel McCotch, who did our sound design, who did all the sound in this film, as well as our composer, Nima, uh, Nima Fakrara, these guys really uh, created a, an atmosphere and an environment that, that is really responsible for the tension and catharsis and all those things that the audience is feeling. Um, and one of the main things we talked about is, is how do we use uh, the natural world to um, how do we how do we find sounds that exist in the natural world that can always ride this line between uh, between being beautiful and awe inspiring, but also being threatening and 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 terrifying simultaneously, and and reinforce the central theme of isolation and. You know, Federico Verardi, our cinematographer, also, you know, we, we, he also took the same approach to this in that the woods, the environment, the, this Pacific Northwest landscape is, is, is a key character in the film. And more specifically, the trees within that tree line is, is, is the unknown. And it goes on for, you know, thousands of miles at times. And there was something about, again, visually speaking, being above those trees and looking down and imagining being in the middle of that and how, how far from any safety you would be. This became important visual motif. You know, in talking to Sam and Nima, we thought about, well, how do we make the trees a, a sound motif? So how do we constantly remind the audience of these trees that she's completely dwarfed by and engulfed in? The common choice is wind blowing through leaves. Sam came up with this idea of, of, of the creaking trees. We try to constantly remind the audience and the viewer that until she escapes this, this tree line, she is, she is always going to be vulnerable and in danger. Give us the good stuff. Are there any interesting behind the scene anecdotes that you would like to share with our crowd today? The first take of uh, Jules Wilcox running through the woods, she tripped on a root and broke her foot in week one. I remember driving her home from the set that day, telling her that, look, you know, it's so disappointing, but we can't go home. You, you know, I, I feel terrible that you're hurt and, uh, and we'll work together again. However, if there's any part of you at all that wants to keep going, then I promise that we will make this work and we'll keep you safe and, and we can do this. She didn't flinch for a second. She said, oh, of course we have to keep going. And uh, her stunt double, Michelle Damis, des deserves a ton of credit. I mean, Jules performed the rest of the movie in a walking boot. She just displayed the kind of toughness and grit that, that you don't see in a lot of people. I'm pretty sure I don't have it myself. You know, by the end of it, I thought, man, Jules is, is Jessica. I think that's an important story for people to know about, to understand what she's all about. Well, John, it's been absolutely wonderful having you today. Well, uh, I'd love to thank Grimfest and, and anyone and everyone who's watching this movie. Um, it's, it's a thrill to be there. It's a thrill to have uh, the, the audience in the UK watch our movie. It's a, a, it, was, it was wonderful talking to Miriam, and uh, she had some, uh, some great atypical questions, so it was nice. Uh, sometimes you get the same one every time, but no, she's... Is a great interviewer, and anyway, it's a, a joy to be uh, be part of your festival, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the movie. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much, and hope to see you again soon.